Today in our third installment of the Kingdom series, I'd like to preach from the sermon, sermonic topic, No More Excuses. Could you help me uh, recite this sermon title to your neighbor and just look at your neighbor and just shout, neighbor, no more excuses. Now, if your neighbor's face look funny, do me a favor. Look at him one more time and just bug your eyes out at him. Just look no, and say, neighbor, oh, neighbor, no more excuses. <laughs> Pray for me, Brother Dorsey. Child of God, my wife and I had a beautiful time when we were able to go back to South Carolina to be with our people in between the uh, New Year's Eve and uh, New Year's uh, Christmas Eve, rather. We had a beautiful time for the week that we were home. Uh, I don't know if I've told you this story, but I'd like to share it with you sermonically. I was at home and we was enjoying our people. And you know, you, you, when you go home, you always find something that needs to be done. And I found myself at my mother's house and I was trying to replace something in her bathroom. And I used um, the tools that I had and sometimes when you're trying to replace something, you use the tools that you have. So I got these pliers, right? And I was trying to unscrew this bolt, this nut. And for some reason, I could not get a good grip on it. And every time I thought I had a good grip on it, it seemed like the pliers just slid across the bolt. And I noticed that I began stripping the bolt. So every time I thought I had a good grip, I did it three or four times, church. And every time I kept stripping the boat. Finally, in frustration, I decided to go back through the toolbox and I found uh, a pair of screw drivers that were able to help me, a pair of pliers that were able to help me. And I was able to loosen that bolt. And the purpose of me sharing that with you is that in 20. 24. There's some things that have slipped in your past and you have not yet been able to gain a good grip on those things. But if you want to unlock and unloose and be delivered from some of the things that's caused you to slip before in the past. You have to use the tool of the word of God that will help you unlock those things. Do I have anybody in here today that understands that the word of God is what's going to help you get a grip on your life? And the word of God is what God wants you to use to unlock and unfold the destiny that God has for you, even in 20 and 24. Child of God. God, it's the word of God that will help you overcome the challenges that have affected you mentally. It's the word of God that will help you get beyond the mental issues that you may be dealing with that tell you that you cannot be who God wants you to be and you will not do what God wants you to do. You have to use the word of God to unlock the screw of your life that will lead you into your destiny in 2024. Am I talking to anybody today? And you need to understand that, beloved, because if you don't know that the word of God is so powerful to place a grip on the thing that you need to get a good grip on, you need to get a good grip, child of God, on, on your positivity in 2024. 
Some of us are pessimistic all the time and negative about everything. And instead of speaking something positive, sometimes we come on and give me an amen. We end up speaking something negative. You need to get a good grip on your attitude. Somebody shout attitude. I feel like preacher today. You need to get a good grip on your attitude uh, in 2024. You need to get a good grip on being motivated to do the will and the work and the ways of almighty God. Beloved, the word of God is what's going to give you the grip on your life you need to unlock your destiny. Today. And as we find ourselves situated and acculturated in this powerful Lucan gospel, we find Jesus at a place in his ministry that gives us a powerful point that I'd like to share with you today. We find Jesus having this consistent pull and tug and battle with the Pharisees and scribes. Uh, child of God, Bible readers, all Jesus was really trying to do was do the will of his father and obey the father and get to Jerusalem so he can die for the sins of the world. But he kept having this back and forth with the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees who were leaders of the people of God and supposed to be experts in God's word, the law. But instead of appreciating Jesus, they would find themselves trying to catch Jesus in a trap. And there's some powerful principles in that that we could learn uh, from the Pharisees. Many times we are so caught up in and focused in the logistics of how things are done. That we forget about the good that is being done. Say amen when you can. Uh, don't get so caught up in the how. Focus on the what. That was worth coming to church. You don't even know it yet. D don't get so caught up in the how of a thing. Get caught up in what is the thing that's been going on that's good. And he, Jesus would find himself in these battles and Jesus would sometimes have to use parables. Somebody shout parables. And, and parables are comparables. It's when you take a theological thought and, and you have used that as a parable as the bridge that helps the person see the theological point in their everyday language. So Jesus is giving parables to these religious leaders. And one of the parables that he gave them is a thought that I'd like to give you on today. And it's something that you and I sometimes struggle with. And it's the, uh, the purpose of this whole sermonic presentation. And here it is. Sometimes we use too many excuses. Oh, child of God, I hope this wakes you up today. Sometimes if we're going to be honest and make this thing personal, we got an excuse for everything. And many times we don't realize that as kingdom subjects, God gets fed up with us give, coming up with excuses. Somebody shout excuses. Let me ask you a question. When it's time to do what the Lord says to do, do you sometimes come up with an excuse for why you cannot do what the Lord asks you to do? Let me tell you what an excuse is. Somebody shout an excuse. An excuse is an illegitimate reason for why you won't do what you know you can do. I'm preaching on today. An excuse is an illegitimate reason for why you won't do what you know you can do. Now, Jesus in his battles, and I want you to stay with me as I explain this to you. Jesus in his battles would frequently find himself around these religious leaders who were not interested in the transformative power that Jesus offered. They were only interested in seeing if they can uh, really dumb down his influence and trap him in something. So instead of gaining and gleaning uh, wisdom from the messianic master, all they did was ignore the good that he did and focus on him breaking the rules. And Jesus would sometimes find himself doing good on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was supposed to be a day of rest where no man can work. But Jesus had to tell the Pharisees that the Sabbath uh, man was not created for the Sabbath, but the S Sabbath was created, come on, uh, for man. And you find Jesus in Luke chapter 14 and Jesus is having uh, dinner in the house at the house of a, a prominent Pharisee and he's eating with them and they intentionally brought a sick man in the house of a Pharisee. 
And the reason why they intentionally brought this sick man there on uh, in the house of this Pharisee was, beloved, they wanted to see if they invited Jesus, would Jesus heal him? And they invited him on the Sabbath just to see what Jesus would do. And so they got this man there that was dealing with dropsy. Now, dropsy is an infection that uh, the byproduct of the infection is uh, fluids that build up on the person. Many times it's caused by cancer or some kind of kidney or liver disease. So they got this man in there dealing with uh, the illness of dropsy. And Jesus looks at him and Jesus asks uh, them, um, uh, would anybody be willing to heal him? And nobody said anything. And, and Jesus said, now, if that was one of your ox, your oxen, amen, or, or one of your children that fell into a pit, and if that happened on the Sabbath day, would you get your oxen out the pit? Would you get your son out of the pit? So Jesus took the man by the hand and he healed him of his disease and he shut them down. And while Jesus is there dining with this Pharisee, Jesus decides to give a parable dealing with three groups of people. Jesus deals with the invited guests. Somebody shout invited guests. Jesus deals with the host. Somebody shout the host. And I need you to understand that Jesus even deals with a dinner and he uses the dinner. Watch this. Hear me, balcony. Jesus uses the dinner, the host and the invited guests to teach kingdom principles. Somebody shout kingdom principles. Now, what I'm getting ready to do is explain to you some of the kingdom principles that Jesus taught. And he used the dinner that he had with this religious leader to do it, hoping that you'll see these principles. Watch this and not just look at these false, fake and fictitious religious leaders that you will look at yourself. Somebody shout myself, 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 myself. See, church is not for you to condemn nobody else. Amen, somebody. Church is for you to look into the Bible at yourself and see what I can do to improve because many of us are no different from these people in the Bible. Amen, somebody. And we need a savior just like they needed a savior. Here's the conundrum in the text. These Jewish religious leaders thought that they were so far ahead of the game and everybody and thought that they were better than everybody. They had sort of a kind of esoteric belief that only a small group of people were able and smart enough to be able to grasp the difficult concepts of the Bible, the word of God, not knowing that God wanted the kingdom to be for everybody, Jew and the Gentile. Amen, somebody. Those with five degrees and those with no degrees. Amen, somebody. Those who have a big house or those who are homeless. I wish I had somebody in this place on today. He wanted the kingdom to be for everybody. The problem is the people to whom God sent Jesus to establish his kingdom refuse to believe in him. The Jews to whom God sent Jesus to establish his kingdom rejected Jesus. Jesus says, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. How I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers her brood under her wings. It, isn't it amazing that Jesus, hear this, wanted to gather all of God's children together. But because of their unbelief, be, because of their indignant attitude, towards who God sent. Jesus said, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, you, you, you kill the prophets and you stone the preachers. And many people need to clearly understand that God sent Jesus so all of us can get into his messianic kingdom because in his kingdom you have hope. In his kingdom, child of God, you have assurance. And it, there's a difference between insurance and assurance. I wish I had somebody. In, in the kingdom, you know uh, that the king is watching out 
for you. You know that the king is going to look out for his faithful subjects. In the kingdom, you know that the king got everything that we need. In the kingdom, you need to know that as long as I'm faithful to the king, whatever it is that I'm dealing with and going through in my life, the king got what I need. Is there anybody in Newburgh Church of Christ who is in the kingdom to know the king got everything I need? He has grace when I need it mercy when I need it, forgiveness when I need it, love when I need it, and if everybody turned their back on you, the king is going to be there for you to lift you up in your life and let you know you're going to be all right because you're subject to the king. So there's value. Somebody shall value. There's value being in the kingdom. So you, when you read this, I don't have time to go over all of it except to tell you, child of God, I want you to go um, home and your leisure reading, I want you to read the totality of Luke chapter 14. But in the first group of people that he gives a parable to, it is the invited guest. Because while Jesus, Brother Bob C., is in this house of this Pharisee reclining uh, at his table, feasting on a meal, here's what Jesus sees. He sees the people who have been invited all jockeying for the good seats. Y'all all right? He, he, everybody now, now in this day and age, the good seats and the honorable seats were those who were closest to the host. So everybody was trying to get close. And what Jesus has to do is use that issue to teach them a kingdom principle. What's the kingdom principle, Jesus? The kingdom principle is those who are last, God Almighty shall be first and those who are first shall be last and he said when you come to a dinner don't be jocking and vying for the good honorable seats because you could be sitting down at a seat that belonged to somebody else who is invited who is more distinguished than you and if you're in the wrong seat trying to get the honorable seats the person who is the host may come up and say excuse me uh yeah this seat is for somebody else and if you don't mind would you go to the back of the bus uh, they met somebody and, and you don't want to get disgraced or embarrassed so but what will happen is if you go to the back row and the back seat. And if the host wants to honor you, he will get you up in front of everybody and bring you from the back all the way to the front. And everybody in the audience will know that you are somebody to the host. Amen, somebody. Aren't you glad that I don't have to be all up in the front? I can just be in the back and just open up my mouth every now and then and be a servant to the king. And the king will reward me publicly for everything that I've done privately. I wish I had somebody that knows that that if you last, you'll be first in the kingdom. It's not like the world where everybody wants to be first. You can be last and be first in the kingdom. So that's for the invited guest. Then he deals with the host. Somebody shout the host. Now, when he deals with the host in this parable, which is a comparable, uh, Newberg family, it is really germane and apropos to us because... I think you can find value in this. When he deals with the host, he says, host, when you invite guests, don't just invite the folk who rich. Don't, don't, don't invite the folks who, who got it like you got it. Uh, don't, don't just invite the people who uh, you know that if you invite them, they're going to pay you back and they got the means and the funds and the ability in the house uh, to accompany people like you and other folk like you. But he said when you, when you invite folk, he said you need to invite those who are crippled. Mm -hmm. I invite those who are poor. I invite those who can't see who are blind and lame and uh, are crippled. Why, Jesus? Because in the kingdom, we have a principle of righteousness and we can not judge people and we can't just make it about the people who we know that will reciprocate our blessings to them. We want to bless folk that can't bless us back because we know that our blessings won't just come from people. They come from the God who created the people. And not only that, our blessing is going to come in the resurrection. Amen, somebody. Do you not know that you may not get 
the money back from people you gave money to uh, now? Let, let, okay, let me just take it. Do me a take a deep breath. Just take it. Get, get the oxygen back in your system. Now, some of y'all mad in 2024 because the person you gave $100 to. Y'all smile with me today. Lean on your neighbor and shout, they never going to pay you back. Go ahead. They, they, they never, they never going to pay you back. It's been 50, it's been 50 next Fridays. <laughs> Am I right about it? The way Brother Tyron, they say, I'll pay back next Friday. Man, it's been 50 next Fridays and they still ain't paid you back. And now you have messed up a relationship because y'all ain't speaking no more. That's why when you, you don't let folk borrow money, you just give it to them. Somebody said, just give it to him. Just give it to him. And that way, it don't ruin the relationship when they can't pay you back that next Friday. Praise God. But my point of saying that, child of God, is to tell you that don't worry about getting it now. <laughs> your reward is going to be in the resurrection. Somebody open up your mouth and make some noise and give God some praise. If you know my reward is going to be in the resurrection, in the resurrection, in the resurrection, God is going to pay me back for everybody who couldn't pay me back. What's the principle? Look at God as repaying you back and rewarding you and not people. Amen. Because otherwise you'll stop doing good because of how people treat you. Anybody ever stop doing good because you were mad because of how people treated you? But no, no, don't you ever stop doing good. Just know that the good that you do that is recognized in heaven. Anybody know that the good that you do is recognized in heaven? I ain't got nobody excited about it on today. I said the good that you do is recognized in heaven. And the God of heaven will pay you back. Then he deals, then he deals with the dinner. Somebody shout the dinner. Now, here's really why I took you here today. Um, in this dinner, uh, the Bible teaches and tells us uh, about the dinner and really what he's really articulating. I want you to know what he's really articulating contextually. He's, he's articulating a teaching that would help the false, fake, and fictitious religious leaders called the Pharisees understand that they were rejecting the kingdom. That's really what he's doing. Now wedged and woven within the tapestry of this text is a powerful principle that's relatable to, to us. And here it is. It's the principle of uh, it making excuses. Now he said, and you really understand the attitude of God when you read this powerful par parable, beloved. And here it is. He said that <clears throat> there was a man who had a dinner and he sent his slaves out to invite many persons to this dinner. And when the dinner feast was ready and had been prepared and the hour had come. He sent his slaves out there to let them know it's ready. The feast is ready. But when he went back and invited the and told the people that the, the feast was ready, here's what the people gave him. Excuses. Somebody shout excuses about why they could not come. Listen to the crux, child of God. It's going to bless you. The, 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 the host is inviting people to a feast. He invited everybody to come and, and, and enjoy the feast. And he sent his slave out to invite persons. And not only that, not only did he invite, send his slaves to invite persons, when the feast was ready, he sent the slave back out, and here's what the slave was met with. Excuses. Somebody shout excuses. One more time, excuses. We're in church today to encourage you not to have no more excuses. I said, we're in church today. I'm going to get a witness today to encourage you not to have. I said, we're in church today. To encourage somebody to have no more. Now, why are we in church talking about having no more excuses? Because I'm getting ready to show you 
that the person to whom uh, he is referring to, the man who had the dinner, is really Jesus. And if you're not careful and not realize that the man in the passage is Jesus, then you'll miss out on the feast that Jesus has prepared for you. Now, I don't want nobody to miss out. So here's what happened. He was met with excuses. Two of the excuses deal with consumerism. In other words, uh, it dealt with what they had bought. Let's go to the Bible. The Bible says in Luke chapter 14, in verse uh, number 16, but he said to him, because the man who had referred to the kingdom and everybody would be blessed in the kingdom, that man said that not realizing that everybody who was at the table is not going to be in the kingdom. So the man who just had uttered out of his mouth, blessed is everyone that eats in the kingdom of God, everybody who was there ain't going to be in the kingdom. And what Jesus has to do is articulate that. Notice your Bible. But he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner. He invited many. And at the, t at the dinner hour, he sent his slave to say to those who had been, been invited, come for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land. And I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Now, wait a minute. Most folk look at the land before they buy it. So why you got to look at it if, if you not already bought it? See, see, what we try to do, Newberg, is we give silly excuses so that we could justify in our minds that we're still okay, knowing that we're not okay, because we give ridiculous excuses that don't make no sense. But we try to justify it in our minds so that we don't have to do what's being asked of us. And I'm telling you that many times we're lying to ourselves. Lean on your name and just shout, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to Well, Brother Jones, I just wasn't able to make it today. Y'all got, got quiet. And I ain't judging nobody. But my question to you is, are you lying to yourself? Because how is it that two hours later, you was miraculously able to go to the grocery store? Um, you mean tell me a miracle happened two hours at the church? Now, you knew you was lying to yourself when you said it. It didn't make no sense to you when you uttered it from your mouth. Amen, somebody. How you got to go look at a piece of land that you already own? That dealt with consumerism. And here's the principle with consumerism. A lot of times we buy things and we place the things before the God who created the things. Well, I got tickets to Beyonce. Okay, let me let me come over here. That they look like they're about to throw something at me over on that side over there. I'm gonna pray for them. <laughs> All I'm saying, child of God, is ask yourself, am I lying to myself? And what is it in me that does not want to do what God asks of me? So I got to deal with myself. What's wrong with me on the inside that I don't want to do what God is asking me to do? And why will I make an excuse that don't make no sense to nobody, not even yourself? Then he says, he says, notice the second excuse that deals with consumerism. He says, um, another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Now, don't most folk just don't buy cars without looking at them. You don't know if the oxen got legs, eyes. You don't know if they about to die. 
so everybody is smart enough to go and check out the product before you purchase it. Now, sisters, you were supposed to give me an amen right there. Because me, you know, I order a suit online. So the Jones, mm, she want to go and see how that thing feel. She want to try it on. It sisters, y'all ain't helping me. She want to try it on. She want to step up on the step and just see how it look. Praise God. Brothers, we just go in in five minutes. We be out. Give me a color black and a, and a 42 and I'm gone. Game on. Praise God. Ah, y'all ain't helping me. So I'm simply saying that usually we try things out before we purchase them. So one of the things that causes us not to be closer to the Lord is consumerism. Uh, bought a field. And those two things are connected. Field and oxen, those two things are connected. But then he has a relationship excuse. Somebody shot relationship excuse. And one of the men said, notice this. He said, uh, another one said, I have married a wife. And for that reason, I can't come. No, it's not a good reason. You know why? You married and go to work. You married and go to the gym and your wife ain't there. I wish I had somebody. You got a man cave and your wife not down there. I wish I had a brother that can shout amen. Your marriage ain't stop you nowhere else. But how does your marriage stop? Now, we, 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 we give you your honeymoon now. We're going to let you go to Hawaii. Amen. We're going to let you go to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Amen. So what is that? It's an excuse. Somebody shout excuse. It's an excuse not to do what the Lord wants us to do. And just know that you too have made some excuses for why you won't do what you know you can do. And the penalty for those who always have an excuse could be your exclusion from the kingdom of God. And you needed to hear that. With all the love and sincerity in my heart, let me just tell you, I'm saying this in love. I'm not going to beat you down. I'm not going to do that. The world beats you down too much. The devil beats you down too much. Life uh, beats you down too much. The preacher ain't going to beat you down, but the preacher has an obligation to be honest with you. And many of you here could be hearing the kingdom message every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Thursday with Brother Duncan, every Tuesday and Friday with me on praying with the preacher, every Saturday with... Brother Sanders, and many of you could be hearing the message and you're near, you're there, you're at the table. But you got an excuse for why you won't capitulate. And your excuse won't help you when Jesus comes back. Young people, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. You can't put the world in front of the word. And expect the word to take you into heaven when the judgment comes. It doesn't matter how young you are. If you know you've done wrong and you need a relationship with God. Listen, we got a God this good. Anybody know we got a good God? Anybody know he's kind? Anybody know he's patient? Anybody know he's a loving God that will love you in spite of you? I said, we got a God this good. Food on your table, clothes on your back, water for your thirsty. So I said, we got a God this good. Don't ignore the message of a good God. Because what you, you and I are really preparing for, you know what your life is really about right now? Is preparation for eternity. Let's say that with me. Preparation for eternity. Again, preparation for. My life is about prepper for. Balcony, I can't hear that. My life is about prepper for. Balcony, I still can't hear none. It's about prepper. 
what your life is about. You ought to teach that to your, ki uh, to your kids at your kitchen table every day. You 12, your life is about preparing for eternity. Your life is about what Jesus sees you do and say and think what your life is about. I didn't know that's when I was your age, Cameron. I needed somebody to tell me that my life was about preparing for where I'm going to spend eternity. And the world needs to hear because the world that we're living in is sick. It's sick. The world that we're living in is sick. It, it, it kills people who tell God's truth. It suffocates the behavior that God expects of his people in his word. It denounces and renounces Jesus Christ as God in the flesh. That's the world that we live in. But remember the call and the assignment of the subject in the kingdom. Our job is to reflect the behavior on earth. The same way that behavior is being uh, perpetuated in heaven. So the same behavior that's going on with God's subjects in heaven is what God wants us to display on earth. I said the same behavior mm -hmm, that is going on in heaven is what God wants people in the kingdom to display on earth. Okay. So here's what he said when everybody gave excuses, different excuses over consumerism over relationships, and what's your excuse? What's your excuse, child of God? Don't, don't, don't you look at nobody else. I want you to process this in your mind. What's your excuse by, for why you hadn't been as dedicated? What, is, what lie are you telling yourself why you can't come? It's amazing how inconsistent the people of God are with the things that we desire that we want we'll find a way to get to those things but when it comes down to the things of God that we don't want to do we'll find a way to get out of it every last person has done it myself included that's the level that the kingdom has to be on it is a higher level of behavior it is a higher level of conduct. It is a higher level of understanding to know that I am subject to the king and it's not about my will, it's about his will. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that's what he requires of people in the kingdom. Now notice what he told the slave to do. Now let me just show you the attitude and, and, I, and I'll give you a couple things and the lesson will be yours. Notice the attitude of the host. I want you to see this in your Bible. Notice the attitude of the host when they kept hearing, he kept hearing all of these excuses. The Bible says in verse number 21, child of God, and the slave came back and reported this to his master. Then the head of the household became angry. Now, can I tell you, he's talking about God. He's talking about how God has invited all of the Jews who rejected Jesus. And how that's applicable to us is God has invited all of us in here today. He's given you an invitation to feast on his word and to feast at his table and to have a relationship with a sinless, suffering, serving uh, sovereign savior every day of the week when you wake up in the morning you got a relationship with Jesus when you go bed in the to the bed in the evening you got a relationship with Jesus he's always with you he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you he's giving you eternal life eternal life and he's given it to us he invites us to have union with him and we give every excuse in the in the book that we can't come. So notice the attitude of the master. He says, 
Then the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and the lanes of the city. Watch this. And bring in here the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. I want you to understand what he's saying symbolically, parabolically. <clears throat> he's referring to the Jews' rejection of the Messiah. And he's saying, now go out and get the Gentiles. Go out and get the ones who were not born into the Hebrew family. Go out and get the ones that have been rejected as outcast in society, in Jewish society and the community. Get the ones who had leprosy. Get the beggars who don't even have clothes to put on. Get the ones that have been rejected. And watch this, invite them. Now, before you look at that too crazy, you and I are Gentiles. You and I belong in the same category. Now, right now, you're not as excited about it as you need to be because you don't realize that you were not born into God's family. And you don't realize that you, were, you did not do anything good enough to be a part of the kingdom. You do not realize that God didn't have to, but he did it anyway. And he allowed me to hear the kingdom message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and brought me near to the cross. And your Christianity will get better. Not your churchianity, your Christianity. That's another, that's another Sunday. Not your churchianity. I said your Christianity will get better when you began to appreciate the invitation. There needs to be an appreciation of the invitation. That, that, that God, inv anybody ever been excluded from an invitation? Anybody remember how that felt when when somebody else that you thought you was on the same level got invited? Oh, yeah, you talking about a hurt? Man, you and then you start hating a little bit too on the low. Just some sly hate. Now hold up now. My grades were better than them now. I've been doing this thing longer than them. And we start hating a little bit. You know why? Because rejection hurts. Rejection challenges the core of your being. It challenges you because someone has made you to feel less than. Someone has, has hurt your heart to the point where they have degraded your humanity. They want you to feel as if you're not good enough. But aren't you glad that God extends an invitation regardless of who you are, your skin color, what you've done, who you've done it with, and where you've been? Aren't you glad that the invitation exists for you to come into his kingdom? So he says, I want you to get poor folk. I want you to get the lame, crippled people, blind people, and invite them. And then the slave went out and said, Master, I brought all those back. And guess what he said? And I got to close. He says, there's still room here. Lean on your name and just shout, there's still room here. Come on. I said, said shout, there's still room here. In other words, the king wants the place, the kingdom to be filled isn't that good to anybody that the king wants the kingdom to be filled with Jews and Gentiles, bond or free, male or female? But when the slave went out and got all those people, went to the highways and byways, and he went uh, everywhere he could to the streets and the lanes, and he got everybody he could, and the Bible said there was still room here. And now maybe there's somebody watching online. Maybe we do have a visitor here today that doesn't realize how important it is to know that in the kingdom of God, no matter what you've done, 
he's inviting you to come because there's still room here. The, the, there's still room here. Some churches, we're we, we so sorry. We've run out of room. Aren't you glad you with Newburgh Church of Christ? <laughs> oh, I'm about to run around the pulpit. There's still room here. No matter what you've done, where you've been, who you've done it with, there's still room here. So what's, what's the application? I want you to look at verse number 24 and I'm gone. Verse number 24. That's all right. 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 Verse number 24. The Bible says, for I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. Is that in your Bible? Okay. I'm going to have to end this thing. <clears throat> I just want you to understand, child of God, that you could be invited, but if you receive the invitation to enter into God's kingdom, the rule, the reign, the power, the dominion of our sovereign king, Jesus, and those who are his subjects in the spiritual realm, you have an opportunity and he's inviting you today. You can have an invitation and still not enter. Because you rejected coming to the king's invitation. So what I'd like to see you do is come and respond favorably to the king's invitation. God is inviting you into the kingdom of God today. The question is, will you come? Did you hear what I just said? God is inviting you into the kingdom of God today. Question is, will you come? You need humility to enter into the kingdom of God. Because the issue with these Pharisees is that they thought they had it all figured out. They thought they knew enough. They thought that they were on that level. They thought that they didn't need nobody else to tell them what they should do with their life. We went to school. We got a degree. We got this thing figured out. And if you don't humble yourself, uh, God will bring you down. You bet. Listen, you stop exalting yourself. Humble yourself and God will exalt you. Has God exalted anybody? When you humble yourself, give a good God a good praise right there. When I humble myself and trusted God, he exalted me. That's what you got to realize. Stop lying to yourself. Do the will of God. Come get your seat at the king's table and feast on the salvation the Lord wants to give you because there's going to be a day when you're going to appreciate your humble submission because when you heard the king invite you, you didn't reject it. You didn't say, you didn't say why I like Naaman. Is there another river I can go to that's cleaner than this? Naaman, you better get your butt in there and dip seven times. Up here worried about the, the, the EPA of Jerusalem. Environmental Protection Agency. Ah. Uh, and the principle you learned there, Newberg family, is you can get clean in dirty water. Just do what the king says. He's inviting you to his feast. The question is, will you come? And he wants to make your life better. He's not going to make you perfect because he is. He says, believe in him because he's perfect and have faith and be obedient and do the best you can. And he'll take care of the rest. He'll take care of the rest. What's your excuse? 
I got to do this with my family, dealing with relationship. What's your excuse? I got to go make some money. Well, well, what shall it profit a man? And he's not against you making money, but if you put money before God, then that's your God. What's your excuse? The water's cold. Really? All these people we baptize, do you not know we keep our water as a deacon come every Sunday? Am I right, Brother Sanders, to check the water to make sure it's warm for y'all? What's your excuse? Well, 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 in my house, we never been religious. Well, you got the word of God today and he's inviting you. What's your excuse? We, didn't wanna, we don't want to hear Tupac lyrics. What's your excuse? What lie will you tell yourself that you know you can do, but you're unwilling to do it? Now, remember this. Those same lies that you tell yourself that become your excuse won't work with God. They're not going to work. They're not going to work. Let me tell you this. There's still room in here. <laughs> Clap your hands if you're excited about the fact that there's still room in here. There's still room in here. There's still room. Still room. That's my sermon. Now I'd like for you to, I'd like for you to spend these next few moments <clears throat> processing in your mind what you've heard. I'd like for you to think about some of the things God has called you to do, but you gave God excuses. God, I cannot come to Bible class. I just don't feel well. But you felt well enough to play the PlayStation for four hours. You felt well enough to go to the new Publix for two hours. Because you know, you, you know, that place is packed. Yeah, you saw it on television, man. That grocery store making some money. Hear me when I tell you. But let me just tell you something about our excuses. None of our excuses will work. None of our excuses. Mine, yours, none of our excuses. You can justify it in your mind so you can feel better about yourself, but all we're doing is lying to ourselves. This year, our, our vision is kingdom culture. And the only way that we're going to be able to develop a culture that is reflective of the king to do it the king's way is if people make a kingdom commitment. Somebody shout kingdom commitment. Now, what I just told you is going to help your life get better. Your faith is going to get stronger. You're getting ready to get wiser. You're getting ready to be more humble because you've made a kingdom commitment. Whatever the king's way is, that's what I'm going to do. And when you make that commitment, then our church culture will start changing and people will be here and be nice and loving and and i know we already doing that but more people will be nice and loving and we'll be able to do more ministries because we have the foot soldiers that have made a kingdom see until you make a kingdom commitment then you don't know what god could do with your life and god can do some stuff with your life that you never imagined in a million years that he can do with your life if you just make up your mind to be committed to Jesus, is that all right today? Is that all right to be committed to Jesus as your king? And what I learned is, man, I tried my way, but my way didn't work. Anybody by show of waved hands and eight man's tried your way before and it made you miserable, depressed, anxiety because you didn't know 
you, you knew you couldn't trust in your way. So I'm simply asking today that you accept the invitation to come. How do you do that here at this church? You simply make up your mind to believe in Jesus' word, that Jesus is, the, is indeed the resurrected Savior. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins. Somebody shout, he died on the cross. Believe that he did what? He, you got to believe that he died on the cross for your sins. Y'all got that? Now, don't you worry about nobody else's sins. You just need to know that he died on the cross for your sins. And you ought to at least be able to give God some praise that he died for my sins. Anybody want to praise him because he died for my sins? I, no, I ain't talking about yours. He died for my sins. And for that, I accept his invitation to get in the kingdom. And when you realize that he asked you to believe in him with all of your heart, his death, burial, and resurrection, confess his name, the son of the living God. And according to Acts 2.38, he says, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have not done that the way the Bible teaches, then you are ignoring and avoiding his invitation to come to him. No, we're not talking about that baptism you had when you were a little girl, a little boy, and you had no understanding. We're talking about the one where you had biblical understanding. You may have not known everything about salvation, and none of us do. But you have to know at least the basics. That Jesus died for you on the cross. God raised him from the dead. And he's inviting you to enter into his kingdom today. And all you have to do is come walking by faith, repentance, and baptism for the forgiveness of your sins. He'll cancel out your debt of sin. He'll give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he'll add you to his church, the church of Christ. And then you'll become a kingdom citizen. And all he wants you to do is make a commitment to the king. So you can have a kingdom commitment. And you can develop kingdom character. And then when you come here with your commitment and your character, we can develop a kingdom culture for the next generations to come. Now, if you need to come to Jesus and be baptized and you know you need to do that, I want you to start walking right now to the front two rows. And if you say, well, Brother Jones, I'm just going to wait. Well, how you know you're going to be alive? Wait. What you mean? Wait. If there was a check for a thousand dollars, you wouldn't wait. Matter of fact, the moment you hear a thousand, you, all that spit in your mind already. You think I'm going to pay off this. I'm going to pay that. I'm going to pay that. OK, man, that's a thousand dollars already. Amen, somebody. Now, Jesus then died for you, shed his blood, and he's asking you, will you come? Accept the invitation. And if you don't want to come, my question to you is, what's your excuse? What's your excuse? Now, here's what we want to do. We want to celebrate Jesus today because we want to see you saved. Now, will you make up your mind to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and walk down here and give your life to Jesus Christ today? Will you make up your mind to do that right now? I said, will you make up your mind to do that right now if you hadn't done it? And all you got to do is walk down and say yes to Jesus. If you're willing to do that right now, stand to your feet and come walk down right now while we stand together and sing our song of invitation.